declaring a national emergency. They say walls don't work. Walls work 100 percent. President Trump takes action to obtain more money for a border wall. We'll have a report to break down what it means and the legal challenges ahead. Powerful trip. Vice President Mike Pence visits the memorial site of Auschwitz. We're there with the emotional story of the massive loss of life decades ago. Clergy abuse crisis. An organizer of next week's summit at the Vatican tells us what we can expect. And Catholic college controversy. The president of the Cardinal Newman Society discusses the outrage on the theatrical performances happening on some U.S. campuses. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, February 15, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for News from a Catholic Perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. President Donald Trump officially declares a national emergency. He says he's doing it to protect the country. Today's declaration paves the way for the president to transfer money to build his promised wall at the U.S.-Mexico border. Correspondent Jason Calvi was there for his announcement in the Rose Garden. He joins us now from the White House. Jason? Why, President Trump says he'll spend about $8 billion to build a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. Now, top White House officials say it'll take some of the money originally allocated for military construction and the war on drugs. The president knows he'll face lawsuits and Democratic condemnation. Today, the president lays out his defense. We're talking about an invasion of our country. The commander in chief declares a national emergency. I could do the wall over a longer period of time. I didn't need to do this. But I'd rather do it much faster. And I don't have to do it for the election. I've already done a lot of wall for the election, 2020. Speaker Pelosi yesterday warned the president not to make the declaration. The president is doing an end run about Congress, about the power of the purse. You've heard me say over and over again, Article 1, the legislative branch, the power of the purse, the power to declare war, many other powers. Uh, listed in the Constitution. But Republican Senator Lindsey Graham told me the president is right. You can negotiate with Democrats till the cows come home, and uh, the bottom line is uh, they're not much into giving Donald Trump anything to secure the border, even though they've done it for other presidents. Here's how the president plans to get the roughly $8 billion to build the wall, transferring roughly $2.5 billion from the war on drugs, roughly $3.6 billion in military construction money, and using nearly $1.4 billion from Congress in the just-passed spending bill. And we will have a national emergency, and we will then be sued, and they will sue us in the Ninth Circuit, uh, even though it shouldn't be there, and we will possibly get a bad ruling, and then we'll get another bad ruling, and then we'll end up in the Supreme Court, and hopefully we'll get a fair shake. And President Trump predicts victory. Already Democratic state attorneys general say they'll likely sue to stop the president. Speaker Nancy Pelosi and leader Chuck Schumer claim the president is violating the Constitution. They're pledging to fight back. And many Republican senators, like Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, say the president's declaration was a bad idea. Wyatt? Jason, how have the U.S. bishops responded to this action by the president? The U.S. Bishops' cons uh, Conference is responding, calling the wall a symbol of division and animosity. And they'll oppose President Trump's declaration of a national emergency. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey reporting from the White House today. Thanks, Jason. Continuing a trip in Poland today, Vice President Mike Pence said he and Second Lady Karen Pence were deeply moved by what they saw at Auschwitz. They toured the concentration camp run by Nazis during the occupation of Poland. The Vice President presented a wreath at a site where executions by gunfire took place. He also laid a rose by a train car commemorating the spot prisoners entered the death camp. Pence later said seeing Nazi genocide up close reinforces his resolve to expose Iranian wrongdoing and anti-Semitism. The vice president says it's the same vile hatred that animated the Nazis in Europe. Six million Jewish men, women, and children were murdered by the Nazis in the Holocaust. Catholics were also persecuted and killed. White House correspondent Mark Irons is reporting from Auschwitz tonight with their story. 
The horrific effects of the Holocaust were experienced right here at Auschwitz. Now, the Nazis opened this death camp in 1940, soon after their occupation of Poland began. And when the gates finally closed, when it was liberated five years later, more than a million prisoners had been murdered. A massive loss of life at the Auschwitz-Birkenau complex. 1.1 million Jews killed, their lives brutally snuffed out in gas chambers. And the Nazis' hate extended to Catholics as well. Hundreds of thousands of Polish Catholics and Polish priests perished in Auschwitz and that camp complex. Dr. Suzanne Brown Fleming with the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum tells me the early days of Auschwitz largely saw the suffering of Polish Catholics. If they weren't worked to death, many of them killed through starvation, beatings, and lethal injections. All the people forced through these gates followed a similar pattern. Their head would have been shaved, they would have been issued a number, they would have been issued a set of uh, prisoner uniform pajamas that have become iconic uh, today. One Catholic prisoner, Father Maximilian Kolbe, is now recognized as a saint. When there was a roll call for 10 prisoners to be shot on the famous Black Wall near Block 11, he volunteered his life for another Polish Catholic prisoner and ended up murdered instead. His cell has become a prayerful pilgrimage destination for many, including Pope Francis, who visited in 2016. Dr. Brown Fleming says during the war, Nazi racism was opposed by the Catholic Church, but anti-Semitism still influenced its faithful. It was more common to see Catholics helping Catholics instead of reaching out to suffering Jews. Instances of help for openly practicing Jews was not unheard of, but much more rare. As a practicing Catholic who spent years studying the Holocaust and visited Auschwitz a number of times, Dr. Brown Fleming's takeaway is rooted in the gospel message. To love your neighbor, uh, that, that universal love for others that, that we're taught today as, as Catholics to, to, to live in every way, in our work, in our families. A message for all to prevent what happened at Auschwitz from ever happening again. Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. And our thanks to our EWTN News Nightly team for traveling there to report on this story and for our colleagues at EWTN in Poland. Kentucky Senate passes a bill to ban abortion once an unborn baby's heartbeat is detected. Before voting, lawmakers listen to the beating heart of an unborn baby via an electronic monitor. The proposal now heads to the state's house. Pro-abortion advocates say they will pursue legal action if the bill is signed into law. The state of New York passes a law giving victims of sexual abuse more time to press charges and file a lawsuit. It's known as the Child Victims Act. Catholic leaders dropped their opposition to the measure last month after it was revised to treat public and private entities the same. As the Vatican prepares for a global summit on clergy sex abuse, one of its top diplomats is now facing allegations. Archbishop Luigi Ventura, the Vatican's ambassador to France, is seen here with Pope Francis. Ventura is accused of groping a male employee during a ceremony in Paris's city hall, according to French officials. He was appointed nuncio by, to, in France uh, in 2009 by Pope Benedict XVI. Father Hans Zollner joins us now from Rome. He is a member of the Vatican Commission for the Protection of Minors. Father Zollner is also part of the organizing committee for next week's abuse summit. So, Father, I want to ask you about Archbishop Luigi Ventura. He's the third Vatican diplomat accused of sexual abuse in recent years. French officials are investigating the allegation. Many are asking how could such a high-ranking official be involved in abuse? What's your response? Okay, you have uh, allegations at all levels, and uh, if there is anything that proves those allegations, of course, there need to be consequences. No doubt about uh, who that is and in what position such a person would be. When you think about all those bishops who are coming, uh, they've been asked to meet with victims in their own countries ahead of the summit. Uh, what voice will those victims have in the summit? Uh, certainly uh, the idea of having uh, asked the bishops uh, to meet the victims and survivors of abuse in their country was that uh, bishops especially from countries where this is not yet an openly discussed topic, uh, get the occasion and take the occasion that people uh, who have been wounded grievously uh, can express their, their anger, their disappointment, uh, their rage, their depression, or their hopes. And uh, this will certainly influence 
the proceedings of this uh, meeting because um, once you sit down with a victim of abuse, once you really listen to them, you open your mind, your ears, and your heart, you cannot remain the same person as you have been before. You, you realize that something needs to change. The expectations are high for this abuse summit. Many feel the church's credibility is at stake. Does the Vatican realize the sense of anxiety among the faithful? I would say absolutely so, because uh, it is very clear from the reaction, especially from the United States and other parts of the world, that the expectations are very high, that there is a, a huge um, fear that uh, it would not deliver. So we will try uh, our best, at least um, our organization uh, committee has done whatever it could in the short time uh, that was at our disposal to bring together uh, also a, a very important uh, area of, um, of topics um, that will be addressed. Uh, because for the first time, uh, and this is certainly an outcome of the last uh, months and uh, one year and a half, I would say, in the public discussion, for the first time, uh, we won't talk only about um, precise canonical uh, provisions. We won't talk only about this uh, perpetrator or that uh, bishop who has covered up. We will talk about the influence of the whole system, the institution church, uh, the organizational aspect of the church, and how it contributed to um, uh, the abuse that happened for so long, and that happened undetected or unreported, and uh, how could it be that in this system, in this organization, this institution church that proclaims the gospel, uh, there has happened so much cover-up uh, and so much neglect of victims and of uh, the wounds they have suffered. So much anticipation for this upcoming summit. And of course, our team with EWTN will be there to cover all of it. Father Hans Zollner, a member of the Vatican Commission for the Protection of Minors, thank you so much for talking with us about the upcoming summit. Thanks to you. Thank you. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo wraps up his five nation trip to Europe with a visit to Iceland. He arrived today and has been talking with officials there about improving trade. The visit comes as the Trump administration is blasting the European Union over its approach to Iran. Vice President Pence is accusing the EU of trying to evade U.S. sanctions on Tehran. China says trade talks with the United States will continue next week in Washington. The first round of meetings ended today in Beijing. U.S. representatives say they did make progress on several important issues. The Trump administration is threatening a $200 billion tariff on Chinese imports if a trade agreement is not reached by early next month. Protesters in the Philippines showed their support for a journalist recently arrested by the government. Defend press freedom! Defend press freedom! Maria Ressa is the award-winning head of an online news site known for being critical of President Rodrigo Duterte. She spent one night in jail this week after being charged in a libel case. Ressa's supporters accused Duterte's government of trying to intimidate the press. Coming up, a policy analyst on the continuing political and economic crisis in Venezuela. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. Venezuela's embattled president, Nicolas Maduro, reveals his foreign minister held secret talks with the Trump administration, even as the U.S. publicly recognizes Maduro's opposition, Juan Guaido, as the interim president. El gobierno de Estados Unidos ha arremetido contra Venezuela. In an interview with the Associated Press, Maduro says he will not resign and blames America's sanctions on Venezuela's oil industry for the country's economic decline. He calls boxes of U.S. donated food and supplies, quote, mere crumbs. Ana Quintana, senior policy analyst for Latin America and the Western Hemisphere at the Heritage Foundation, joins us now via Skype. Anna, welcome back. Venezuela is in the midst of the world's, one of the world's worst humanitarian crises. Millions of dollars in food and medical supplies are stuck in Colombia, and Maduro refuses to allow the aid into Venezuela. Why is Maduro blocking this aid, and how do you think this is impacting the people of Venezuela? 
Maduro is blocking the aid because Maduro is not accepting or acknowledging that there's a humanitarian crisis, because to do so would to would be to acknowledge that his regime has bankrupted the country, that they've stolen billions of dollars, and which has led to the to over 80 percent of the population now living impoverished and essentially starving. I mean, that's that's, you know, full point stop why he's not accepting the assistance. President Trump and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo have said Maduro must go. But as we've heard, uh, Maduro says he has no plans to resign. Are, are you surprised the stalemate has gone on this long? No, I mean, it's, you know, it's incredible to think that that Maduro, right, over 50 countries have said that they do not recognize Maduro as the legitimate leader of the country. Uh, but you have to you have to remember something that the government of Maduro, the regime of Nicolas Maduro is not a government of politicians, right? This is a government of criminals. It's a government that, again, has stolen billions of dollars from the country. It's turned the country into an international uh, drug trafficking hub. And it's in their interest to stay in power. And you add to that the layer of the Cuban government's control of, of, of Nicolas Maduro, of the security services, their counterintelligence network within the country. And they feel like they can outlast this. But frankly, I think time is not on their side. Pope Francis has taken a neutral stance as all this has played out. What do you think the Vatican, why do you think, first off, the Vatican has been reluctant to directly intervene? And do you think the Vatican efforts could potentially aid in any kind of a diplomatic resolution? The Vatican shouldn't weigh into this. It's a very complicated political um, not just political, right? I mean, you have the political crisis, you have the humanitarian crisis, and you also have this economic crisis at play here. And you also have the 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 criminality component of the Maduro regime. And I think it would not be it would not be wise for the Vatican to to interfere on on this and and, and within this at this particular time, where the Vatican can play and where the Catholic Church has played a very important role is in helping out with the humanitarian crises. You know, the Catholic Church within the country has really helped, you know, feed much of the poor, has really helped provide medicine, and has filled the gap that the Maduro regime has, has been unwilling to help out, you know, has been unwilling to help out the impoverished in Venezuela. Maduro's main opposition, now what many people consider Venezuela's interim president, Juan Guaido, he's expressing hope for a peaceful transition, but Maduro still has the backing of the country's military. How significant is that? We have to remember, Maduro has the backing of the military brass, right, of the upper echelons of the military. The rest of the military, the rank and file, the vast majority of them, are suffering from the humanitarian crisis just as well. Their families are unable to eat. They're unable to access medication as well. And I mean, it's just, they are also Venezuelans. I mean, they're suffering from, from the catastrophe that, that Maduro has, has wreaked upon the country. So I think it's inaccurate to say, to say that Maduro has the backing. They haven't turned against him. Again, because one thing that has really not been discussed enough is the extreme counterintelligence network that the Cuban government and that the Venezuelan regime, that the regime of Nicolas Maduro have in order, have, have implemented in order to keep the security services, quote unquote, loyal to, to Maduro. And that's why we're seeing that, you know, there have been some defections, but not a lot. Because you have to remember what's going to happen if somebody in the military defects, what's going to happen to their family? You know, they're going to target their family. They're going to imprison the families. I mean, it's, it's very difficult for them. And I think that's why Guaido is asking the military to say, hey, you know what, if you come over to me, if you recognize me, uh, I promise let's let's help there be a peaceful transition and not let this descend into a bloodbath, which is frankly what Maduro wants to see. So many scary things going on in Venezuela mm -hmm. right now and obviously a very complicated political situation. So we appreciate your breaking it all down for us. Anna Quintana, senior policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation. Thanks so much. Thank you. Up next, controversy on Catholic college campuses. We'll talk to the president of the Cardinal Newman Society. And pro-life leaders head to the White House. We'll tell you why. Today is the birthday of Susan B. Anthony, an American champion of civil liberties and women's rights. President Trump says in a statement, quote, we must also never forget that Susan B. Anthony's pursuit for equal rights demands respect for all human life, including innocent, unborn babies. Welcome back, I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. The president also talked about fighting for the unborn yesterday when he met with pro-life supporters at the White House. EWTN Pro-Life Weekly shot this footage of attendees leaving the meeting. There was also a conference call with more than 4,500 pro-life advocates and faith leaders. 
The White House says the president was moved by hearing stories of a late-term abortion survivor and a mother who chose to have her baby rather than having an abortion. The producer of a 1984 pro-life documentary has died after a long battle with pneumonia. Donald S. Smith was 94 years old. He wrote and produced The Silent Scream, depicting through ultrasound the abortion of an 11-week-old baby. It appeared to show the unborn baby letting out a scream during the procedure. The president of the Cardinal Newman Society is raising the alarm on a controversial stage play being performed at a number of Catholic colleges. Patrick Riley calls the staging of the vagina monologues on Catholic campuses an outrage. And Patrick Riley joins me now in the studio. Patrick, welcome back. Why do you think college campuses are allowing this play with overtly sexual themes to be performed? Well, there's a certain attraction, I suppose, for, for the students, right? So they, they want to do this. It's a piece of activism. It's really not a play. It's not a piece of literature. It's certainly not nothing academic. It's certainly not a dialogue. It's a monologue, mm -hmm. right? Um, and why the, the colleges are allowing it is because they've, got, they've been caught into this trap of academic freedom where uh, truth goes out the window and they simply claim that anything that students want to do regardless of morality, is appropriate and allowed on the campus. And it's, this is just a sick, sick display, this show, especially given what has been happening with, with our priests and with the, the priest scandals. Well, let me follow up with you on that because, like I said, the play's not just about sexuality, but it also has a message of abuse. So right. what is it that about that specifically that troubles you, and what kind of message do you think that sends out? Well, there's a particular monologue that describes, it's, it's from the voice of a woman who, when she was 16 years old, describes how she was seduced by alcohol and, and such and, and raped by a 24-year-old lesbian woman, okay? So this is homosexual predation, and this is exactly what we've been dealing with in many of the cases with our priests. And whether or not it is, it's, it's completely inappropriate. But the, the play has the girl, the victim, declaring this her salvation and saying it raised her into a kind of heaven. Uh, originally, the, the wording was taken out of the play. Originally, it was a 13-year-old girl and she described it as a good rape. So I mean, this is just extremely offensive. Yeah, a lot of disturbing stuff. Um, you've talked before, we've talked before about the secular, secular influence on Catholic campuses around the country. So what do you think we as Catholics can do to combat it? Uh, you know, we need to keep telling educators that we want faithful Catholic education, that this is inappropriate. But I, what I advise Catholic families is use your feet Walk. There are many good, faithful Catholic institutions that we promote in the Newman Guide that other lists describe. There, there are good institutions out there. Don't put your young people in these kinds of situations where they're being led astray. What's your advice to students on these campuses, aside from not attending it, uh, about who are faithful to church teaching and, and want to promote church teaching where they are? Uh, well, they need to stand up, they need to speak out. You know, any institution that claims to respect academic freedom ought to be respecting good moral voices. Unfortunately, sometimes those are the people who are the most persecuted, but we need to stand up and proclaim the faith. This is a time when the church, there, there's no time for holding back on the truth. We need to be very clear, very explicit about what is right and wrong. Very important message and, like I say, one that's needed in this day and age. Patrick Riley, president and founder of the Cardinal Newman Society, thanks so much for talking Thank with you. us today. Finally tonight, Pope Francis says we should not be afraid of migrants and refugees. In una sola frase, non abbiate paura. The Holy Father saying the Lord will free us from our fears if we ask. He also says we should see the face of Christ in every refugee and encountering strangers gives us a chance to practice charity. Pope Francis was speaking during Mass at a retreat center outside Rome. Sounds like a pretty good prayer intention for all of those refugees around the world, especially those who have been fleeing violence. And that wraps up our newscast for tonight. We thank you for watching. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We'll be back on Monday with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.